it all changes when uh, other conduct that is not appropriate occurs. And it, it's very sad because, um, you know, this was someone who was one of the major com- contributors to the state in the state's history. Hi there, it's WAMC News Director Ian Pickus. And on this episode of the WAMC News Podcast, more on the coming leadership change in New York state government. We speak with former New York Governor David Patterson, the last lieutenant governor to take over when another governor had to resign in disgrace, Elliot Spitzer, in 2008. Plus, my conversation with the leader of the New York State Senate minority, Republican Rob Ort, about his expectations for the new governor. First, my conversation with former Governor David Patterson, a Democrat. Thank you, Ian. Nice to talk to you. Uh, What do you make of everything we've seen uh, over the past couple of weeks and the downfall of Governor Cuomo? Well, it it was obviously shocking, and particularly the the, uh, catalyst for the downfall, which seemed to be reckless behavior, which was nothing that I ever observed in the governor. I I never saw him act inappropriately toward women. I never heard him speak inappropriately about women, you know, sometimes in all-male circles or just uh, him and me talking. So I was really... uh, perplexed and still am at this development. Have you had a chance to speak with Andrew Cuomo at all? No, I don't think I've talked to him in a few years, actually. Um, I was state party chair. And from there, I went to the MTA board. And then from there, I went to an investment bank. So I haven't talked to him for quite a while. And you were the chair of the Democratic Party in 2014, 2015 or so. So we're talking a, a while back. Right. So you were New York's first black governor, and Kathy Hochul will now become New York's first female governor. What's the meaning of that uh, in your view? Well, it's certainly um, breaking the glass ceiling for uh, African-Americans and women. Um, But in terms of governance, it's not uh, much different than probably any other situation, except that when you go to those groups, there's a tremendous amount of pride. And in, in you, people see their own achievement and their own accomplishment. And it's, um, it's uh, a duty to try to live up to the um, support that you get in that, in that sense. When you were governor, did you feel a lot of uh, pressure on you because you were the first? No, I can't say that I did. Um, you know, because I was the first, although the only thing that does happen sometimes is when you become governor, these communities, women or African-Americans or different nationalities, they don't really know what the governor's powers are and what the governor's limitations. (laughs) So, you know, somebody uh, in the summer of 2008, this is, I've been governor three months and somebody says, well, I don't understand why there aren't uh, equal contracts for minority companies as there are for the white ones. I mean, after all, you've been there three months. I don't know why this hasn't been straightened out yet. And I'm just bemused that somebody could say something like that to me because it takes a while uh, when you make change for it to uh, come to that type type of fruition. Uh, Even 13 years later, we're still trying to get to a point of a level playing field But I would say that Governor Cuomo, following me, did a tremendous job building the program even further. How would you assess Governor Cuomo's tenure, notwithstanding the way that it's ending? Well, he passed same-sex marriage. We had $15 an hour minimum wage. We had paid sick leave. Uh, He um, was extremely instrumental in fighting COVID. He was the national leader on fighting COVID while the uh, uh, president seemed to flourish in a fog of confusion. And really, as an administrator, I don't know that I've met anyone that administrates any better than he does uh, or has. Uh, Then, you know, unfortunately, uh, with all of those great things, kind of like uh, with Governor Spitzer, it all changes when uh, other conduct that is 
not appropriate occurs. And it's very sad because, um, you know, this was someone who was one of the major contributors to the state in the state's history. Along those lines, um, in another recent interview you did um, after Governor Cuomo announced that he would be resigning, you said that uh, way back when Governor Cuomo um, tried to urge Elliot Spitzer not to pick you as uh, his running mate. And you said that after that, you felt you couldn't really trust uh, Andrew Cuomo too much. And to be fair, Cuomo's office uh, disputes your account. So when you were LG and then governor and Andrew Cuomo was attorney general, what was your relationship like? Uh, it, it was pretty good. I mean, it, it changed after that incident because the governor's office can say whatever they want. But the reality is there are plenty of people, Governor Spitzer, his former secretary, Richard Baum, Darren Dopp, who'd been press secretary to uh, the governor's father and who he knew very well. He was the original person that he called. And this is the kind of conduct that gets him in trouble, this sort of mischievous behavior. The fact is that he wanted another candidate to be chosen by Governor Spitzer, someone that the governor had already ruled out. I was not even one of the people considered when he was interviewing people. He just came to me and said, why don't you uh, do this? And that's why it sort of surprised some people. But uh, I'll take a polygraph any time, and I bet not one person in the governor's office could pass one. (laughs) Why didn't he want you? It wasn't as much that he didn't want me. It was that he wanted to try to trade an endorsement with uh, some leaders if uh, if uh, he would endorse that candidate, if they would endorse him. He was trying to set something up like that. That's commonplace. But where I came in is when Spitzer picked me, that ended the whole deal. And, uh, you know, when you get in the way of Andrew Cuomo and a deal, it's sort of like back in the old days when you got between Donald Trump and a camera. (laughs) It's interesting hearing you talk about this because clearly anyone who pays attention to Albany knows that Elliot Spitzer and Andrew Cuomo are not best friends. Uh, So why did Andrew think that he could sway Elliot Spitzer uh, on his LG pick? Well, what he did was he picked somebody he knew in the administration and was telling them a number of things about me that theoretically they would repeat it to Spitzer and Spitzer would say, oh, wow, this is bad information. Maybe we shouldn't take him. No, they didn't have a good relationship. Uh, He was not an advisor to Governor Spitzer, and I never said he was. It was just that he had set up this deal that he thought could work out, and when it didn't, he lost his temper and called up there. And uh, believe me, all the people who worked there knew that he did it, and so does he. Why did you take the invitation to become lieutenant governor when you were obviously been in the Senate for quite a while and you had your own power center there um, before long the Democrats did take control of the Senate? Um, How did you decide uh, to to take that leap? So in 2004, I won four seats from the Republicans cutting their uh, lead in the Senate to uh, three more seats. But by 2006, they had figured out what I was doing. I would only put money that we raised into the seats I thought I could win. We didn't just divide up all the money and and lose all the races. So I knew I needed help or I would never be able to win the majority. So Governor Spitzer and I had a deal. I would, in a sense, trade myself to his team in exchange for him now fully engaging in trying to help the Senate, uh, the Democrats win the uh, majority in the Senate, which we eventually did in 2008. So becoming lieutenant governor, I went from, you know, a pretty prominent person in Albany to lieutenant governor, which the only job lieutenant governor has is to call and make sure the governor's still alive in the morning and your work is done for the day. <laughs> but the uh, <laughs> but the uh, the uh, my feeling was that if I could be instrumental in the Democrats winning the majority, that sooner or later there'd be a place for me. And what I suggested to Governor Spitzer was that if Hillary Clinton won the presidency in 2008, which we all thought she would, that he might be interested in appointing me as the United States senator. And what Governor Spitzer said to me was quite prophetic. He said, I like the idea. Stay out of trouble and I'll do it. You ended up becoming governor instead. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, so let me apply that to where we are in 2021. You were lieutenant governor, then suddenly you became governor. Kathy Hochul has uh, two weeks lead time before she becomes governor. First of all, have you talked to her about your experiences and, and advice uh, going forward? Well, I had talked to her about my experiences all along. I've known her for a long time. She held the first event for me in Western New York when I ran for governor. We we're pretty good friends. Um, you see, Kathy Hochul actually has more than two weeks. When I was sworn in as governor, the budget was due in 13 days. The legislature will not come back into session until January 2022. So my advice to uh, Lieutenant Governor Hochul and Governor Hochul is that she take her time, work through her decisions deliberately, only come to hire people when she's absolutely sure that they're going to carry out her agenda and that they don't have uh, private agendas. And I would think that maybe she might have reason to bring the legislature back in late September, October, something like that. So she herself can go and speak to a lot of the individual legislators, go to the conferences, not just the majorities, but the minorities as well, and that she would um, really get a chance to let everybody know that she wants to have a collaborative working environment too many times. And I'm not talking just about uh, Governor Cuomo, but too many times there's been a sort of imperial relationship between the governor and the rest of the legislature and uh plenty others have done it some of them uh more forcefully than uh this current governor and would really promote a new atmosphere of cooperation which i think she'd be very good at i don't think she wants to be constantly the star that has all the attention on her i think she'd like to empower agency heads, staff members. There was a time in the state where an agency would uh, make a change and list it, and you didn't even see the governor's name. But mm -hmm. in this era of high publicity and constant campaigning, uh, you see not only in New York, but in every other state. I mean, uh, every time they change the linen in a uh, state-run hospital, the new sheets have the governor's name on it. <laughs> Um, you described the transition from Spitzer to your term as governor as a messy time in Albany. A lot of people coming out of the woodwork and saying they were promised X, Y, or Z. How does she avoid that? Because, you know, Governor Cuomo has been here for 10 years, so state government is really made in his image at this time. You know, I don't think that Governor Hochul is going to have that problem. What happened because... This situation has been developing. So it's been going on since the end of February, and she was well aware that it was possible that she would be governor before the end of the year. And the legislatures under, understand that, too. What happened in 2008 was at 145 on March the 10th, a Monday, this article comes out in the New York Times, and it hits Albany like a megaton bomb. And I think... <laughs> It, part of the uh, the effects of it was that the ideas of character, cooperation, civility, honesty, uh, all went out the window, and people were running around as if someone had flown over Albany and dropped ten billion dollars and hundreds all over the uh, <laughs> neighborhood. And what you said is exactly true. There was a prominent person in New York who told me that Spitzer was about to give him a job, but. It wouldn't happen unless, you know, I would support it. I told him I supported it. The person that had the job called me up the next week and said, Governor, I've never cursed a governor in my life, but I'd sure like to curse you right now. If you wanted me to leave, just tell me, and I would have left. And I said to the person, but I thought this was all arranged, and we found out the whole thing was a fraud. There was another person who decided that I should look at an investigation report that the Albany DA was working on about uh, – some of uh, Spitzer's staff. I said, yeah, I'll probably take a look at it some, at some point. The person went straight to the DA's office and demanded the report saying that I wanted it brought to me. And I got a pretty curgly message delivered by controller Tom DiNapoli about how upset the DA was with me. So I had to write him an apology note, like I'm a little kid in class. I mean, all of these things happened. There was one 
uh, uh, official that said that the lieutenant governor doesn't take over when the governor resigns. Said it to my secretary, Charles O'Byrne, in a restaurant the night that the Spitzer story worked. And O'Byrne said, why not? And they said it has to be certified. And apparently this was the person who did the certification, and they refused to do it unless there was a meeting. <laughs> now, there's a shakedown. <laughs> and uh, we ignored the meeting and uh, moved on. So I'm just saying that that for a little period of time when I came in, I felt like I was in one of those movies where demons are attacking all the other people in the movie, and you're the only one trying to survive. <laughs> Um, Kathy Hochul hasn't announced her pick for lieutenant governor as we speak, but she's expected to do it imminently. What's your advice for that selection? Because obviously, you know, two of the last three have en- ended up becoming governor. Well, she said that she would like to pick a person from New York City because that's half of the state's population. She could never be as familiar with uh, how the government works in, in New York City. And uh you know, she could really get some help from a uh, downstate lieutenant governor, the same way a person, say, like uh, Andrew Cuomo took uh, Robert Duffy and took uh, Kathy Hochul to be lieutenant governors under his term. And uh, I just think that um, often there's a breakdown in communication between governors and lieutenant governors. I know when Governor Mario Cuomo was lieutenant governor to Governor Kerry. They got to the point where they took his staff away and took his office away. They were so upset with him. But in this new era, Governor Spitzer gave me more things to do. Uh, I was in charge of energy policy, domestic violence issues, minority and women's business enterprises and other things for that governor. Then some governors have just frozen lieutenant governor out. I think Kathy Hochul will include anyone who wants to work for her best interests on her team. And she wants to run for a full term in 2022. Do you think she would be the front runner or will there be a lot of competition there? Well, she starts out as a front runner because she's the only one that has said she's running. And she has a few months here where there's going to be a very great spirit of cooperation that uh, comes to her. I got it in my first few months. And if she can put together some workable and sensible plans for the state and also demonstrate that uh, she's going to sort of change the atmosphere in the workplace, which is an issue, uh, this would be uh, something that would really inure to her benefit. And it'll all uh, depend on who is perhaps interested in, in running or becoming governor. She's going to have a little bit of a problem because the primaries are always more to the extreme. Republican primaries go more right. Democratic primaries go more left. Uh, Governor Hochul has pretty much been a middle of the roader. But I think on the important issues for progressives that she's going to be there and be there in a big way. Governor Patterson, do you ever miss it? Yeah, sometimes things come up, and I kind of wish I was in position to do something about it where I was years ago. And uh, But I'll tell you, uh, with all the um, uh, media <laughs> requests that I've gotten in the past week, I remember why it was, it's very tiring and why maybe I'd be best at home advising. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just knock them all out at once. Come to a Red Room sometime. <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> Governor David Patterson uh, talking to us about this most interesting time in New York state government. And he has the perspective of having been the last lieutenant governor to become governor of New York upon a resignation. Uh, Thank you for all this time and your memories. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'll just tell you one thing, Ian. Sure. I'll bet you didn't know this. There is actually an organization called the National Lieutenant Governors Association. And I went to one of the meetings. I only went to one and then I became governor (laughs) and They said this uh, governor who had been governor from Iowa said, you never know. Your state could be next. And I thought, ah, that's Iowa, Kansas, Wyoming. These things don't happen in New York, Pennsylvania, Florida, California, and Texas. And I found out that they do. Okay, now let's get to Senate Minority Leader Rob Ort, a Republican from the 62nd District in western New York. To begin with, what's your reaction to what you're seeing in Afghanistan right now? Well, Ian, I think like a lot of veterans uh, and Americans, um, 
it's 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 sort of a combination of of you know dismay, um, anger, uh, heartbreak for me, uh, heartbreak to the people who are there, particularly those who who worked directly with uh, U.S. forces so that we could try to accomplish our mission and, and, and get ourselves back home, but also heartbreak for the American uh, Gold Star families who lost their sons, their daughters, their husbands, their brothers um, over in Afghanistan, and to see all that, all the blood and treasure that was spent and what we were told, to see that sort of swept away very quickly without without a, a fight, it almost seems like, and, and just the chaos of it all. I mean, I said this the other day, it almost looked more like a retreat than an evacuation. It, it looked like we were running out of this country that we had been in for, for 20 years. And, um, you know, there's the old saying, there's never a good way to leave. But in my view, there, there had to be a better way than this. But um, just, just tough, I think, as, on a personal level to, to watch that, um, something that you gave a year of your life for, uh, and some people gave their lives for to still crumble in in a matter of days was uh, was personally tough. Is the policy of leaving Afghanistan after 20 years something you object to, or is it just the way that we're leaving? I, I think it's it's more of the the way. So there's I actually supported the notion and supported the 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 goal of leaving Afghanistan. I think you know at some point. If, if 20 years isn't enough, then you're looking at, what, 40 years, 50 years, forever. Uh, and I don't think that was something that the American public uh, was supportive of, nor do I think we, we should have been supportive of that. Um, and, and you could even argue uh, that, that maybe we should have left years ago. Um, but the fact of the matter was we had been there for 20 years. We had spent a lot of money. We had A lot of people had given their lives. And I think that there was a requirement to me that because of all the blood and treasure that was spent there, that we had an obligation to those men and women who gave their life and who, who've served over there for years. We have an obligation to leave and try to leave in a, in a, a different way than we did. Not like we're trying to just get the heck out of there. I mean, whether it was providing air support to the Afghan army and police, whether it was providing more tactical support on the ground, uh, there just didn't see, it seemed to be really just, we set a timetable with, with the uh, Taliban and we drew down. And as soon as we, you know, were down below a certain amount, um, the you know, they moved in and, and there was just, it, there didn't seem to be any great intelligence. Um, you know, obviously we, we were being told very different things than what we're seeing happen in real time. So it just, I think it's a collective intelligence and foreign policy failure. I think there's plenty of blame to go around. Um, but, but there needs to be, I think, some accounting um, on behalf of the families who, who paid the ultimate sacrifice and just the American public as a whole as to what happened and how, how, did, this, how did this unfold in this way. But, yes, it's more of the way that this has gone about, uh, not the ultimate goal of getting out of Afghanistan. Practically speaking, what would you like to see both New York State government and Congress do in reaction to uh, what we're seeing unfold right now in Afghanistan? So for me, it's, it's, it's sort of twofold. One, in, in a more, uh, I guess, a 50-meter target, I think we need to make sure that, uh, and this is another personal situation that I'm currently dealing with, where there, I have an interpreter that worked with my police mentor team. He is, he is in Afghanistan right now, and we are trying to, to assist him in, in getting out of the country. Have you been able to speak with him? Uh, we have been able to communicate, not, not via phone, but uh, via um, social media platform. And um, uh, another soldier that I served with had been communicating with him, and, and he contacted me uh, to see if there was anything I could do. We contacted uh, our federal representative uh, and are, are working, you know, the normal channels, but trying to to get him in a position where he can get out of the country. Um, he worked with us. He has all the qualifying paperwork. Uh, he has a family. I know what will happen to him. I know what his fate will be and potentially the fate of his family if he stays in Afghanistan and they identify that he worked with the U.S. 
uh, forces. Um, and I know, you know, um, with all the debates over immigration over the last several years, and, and I, I appreciate that and, and the concerns, and we, obviously we want to make sure that we're not bringing in, um, you know, uh, somebody that, that has ill intentions towards the United States, but at the same time, the, the people I'm talking about, these are folks who, who assisted the United States militarily uh, and assisted us at a time when there was great risk to themselves to do so, and they did it under the belief that they were, they were helping to create a better country, a country that did not include the Taliban. And now for them to wake up one day and realize not only was it all for nothing for them, but they're also in great peril, um, I think we have a moral obligation to where we can assist those folks to get them out. Um, you know, whether it's here or whether it's to another country where they can uh, get to uh, safely and, and try to start a new life. Um, and then largely, I think for Congress, I think it's important that they, they need to, to do some oversight here. There needs to be an investigation into what went wrong, how did this happen, and how, do we, how does that inform foreign policy and military uh, policy and strategy going forward. We're speaking with New York State Republican Senate Leader Robert Ort. Let me turn to another subject while I have you. Uh, The New York State Assembly leaders, the Democratic side, announced that they will suspend the impeachment investigation into Governor Andrew Cuomo, but will file a final report. He is due to leave office a week from today as we speak. What are your expectations for uh, where state government is right now uh, as Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul is about to take over? Well, it's in it's it's in a tough spot. Uh, obviously, you whenever you have a, a governor who has been there as long as he has, and uh, and and of course, with all of that comes, you know, over the years, he, his um, his reach into state government, um, you know, went further and further and deeper and deeper, and now you know he is leaving, um, and I think that, that that brings a lot of uncertainty. Um, it brings probably some. Um, you know, there's going to be some jockeying, uh, you know, power of, of horrors of vacuum. And, uh, you know, there's going to be people uh, who are going to try to fill that void left by the, the departure of, of Governor Cuomo. I, I, my expectation, hopefully, is that the report is, um, is a full accounting of where, what they found during the investigation. Um, and I think that's a, that's a reasonable expectation for taxpayers who, who paid for this investigation. You know, we paid for this uh, investigation. There were some questions about, did we need an assembly impeachment investigation early on? Um, but we do have one. They, they spent probably considerable sums of, of public dollars on this investigation. And I think given what we found from the attorney general's report, and given that there's multiple other investigations going on into the governor, and this investigation by the Assembly Judiciary Committee was supposed to comprise all of these different sort of factors, the the nursing home aspect, the book deal, the sexual harassment, um, you know, some other use of government resources, COVID testing. I think given that we did that investigation using public dollars led by public officials, um, regardless of the governor resigning, that there should be a, a public finding of what that investigation found and um, uh, the public should be made aware of that. Have you had a chance to speak with Kathy Hochul since she learned she'd become the governor? I have. I have. Um, I've known uh, Lieutenant Governor Hochul for several years now, um, she, you know, both of us being from the Western New York region. She represented, uh, uh, she was my member of Congress uh, for a short period of time uh, several years ago. So uh, I reached out to her. Um, uh, she, she actually reached out to me. I, I was able to make contact with her. And we had a very good conversation. Um, and look, at I know there's going to be uh, probably, you know, continuing areas philosophically, uh, policy-wise, where we don't agree. Uh, but I'm also hoping that we can do so civilly in a different way than with the, uh, the current governor. Um, and I'm hoping that she brings at least just a different way of governing, uh, less bullying, less intimidation, uh, less sort of cutthroat um, and obviously less corrupt uh, than, the, than the current occupant. So, uh, you know, everything I know of her would say that she would. Um, you know, time will tell, but I, I'm hopeful uh, for her to take the reins here of New York State, uh, at least uh, coming out of the Governor Cuomo uh, era. From your perspective, what should be her top priority on day one? 
Well, I think she's got, you know, uh, she's got a couple that she's going to have to simultaneously do. I think policy-wise, you know, when I look at the, the, the increase um, in, in crime across the state, you know, whether it's New York City, Buffalo, Rochester, I think this is a real, a real challenge for her as governor. It's both a challenge policy-wise. It's also a challenge, I would, I would imagine, politically, uh, as she has announced, she's going to be running for re-election. So I think we have to find a way to talk about public safety um, and, and uh, you know, protecting our communities of all different backgrounds and colors uh, from, the, from the increase in the scourge of, of very violent crime, which is undeniable. Obviously, you have COVID, which is still uh, – uh, the pandemic is still an issue. But I think she has to find a way – to how, how do we, you know, Governor Cuomo was sort of synonymous with the emergency powers and the lockdowns and the mandates and sort of the heavy handed executive orders. I'm hoping that she finds a different way to get us through, uh, you know, the, the future of the pandemic and going forward without going back and reverting to that playbook. Um, I think those are probably the two biggest uh, and, then, you know, just her, her overall relationship with the legislature. Uh, there's a lot to be improved there. The governor, uh, I think over the years, really, really, uh, it became a one-sided affair. And uh, I'm hopeful that her approach with the legislature will be more collaborative uh, uh, on both sides. You know, she said that she's expecting she will want to require masks in schools, given the Delta variant when she takes over. Do you agree with that idea? So I have been um, very critical of of many of the mask mandates, um, which would include uh, uh, the schools. I, I would like to see her, you know, I think we can work together with our local superintendents and school boards uh, to try and come up with guidance that allows them some degree of, of autonomy to do uh, what they feel is best for their students, uh, talking with their parents and uh, local health experts. Um, and, you know, she, I know she powers uh, kind of like what we gave to Governor Cuomo, which I just don't see any appetite for that. So again, I think we're going to have to do something uh, collaborative. I think we can, I think we can get there if we're working together uh, in a spot that that tries to at least address this from from different perspectives. Um, but I, you know, again, I, I think when you look at broadly, I just think we're going to have to get to a spot in where if COVID is here for for forever, I'll say at some level. I think we can all agree that COVID is probably not going to be eradicated or disappear. And so my, my position has been, um, writ large has been, you know, can we, knowing that, how do we live with COVID? How do we take certain precautions? How do we put forward good information so that people can uh, exercise, you know, uh, their judgment, keep people safe, but also allow people, uh, you know, the ability to, to to live their life uh, with some degree of individual responsibility and, and, and freedom um, without, you know, just trying to, to micromanage it. I mean, I think you see, you know, the, the other day there was the example of Australia, um, which I know is, is a probably an extreme example, but it's a, a modern westernized country doing things that I think are, are just beyond the pale um, as far as, you know, telling people you can't even exercise in, with your, members of your own family in your own home. And I think those are things that people are just concerned about, like, where, where is this going to go? So I think if, if she's collaborative and if she's working with the legislature and working with local school officials, and I think the result will be better and, and be more legitimized than if it's just a mandate from Albany or from the governor's office. Robert Ort is the Senate Minority Leader in the New York State Senate. He's a Republican from the 62nd District. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, I appreciate it. Ian, I appreciate you uh, doing the story and taking the time yourself. All right, that does it for this episode of the WAMC News Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, I'm Ian Pickus.